Hey, good morning, Karen. How, how are you? Good morning, Jamie. I'm doing well. I'm Great. happy to be well, with you today. Yeah, it's an honor to speak to you. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to join this series of sentientist conversations. And as you know, it's a series of conversations about what I think of as the two deepest and most important philosophical questions. What's real and you know, what is the universe and how should we best understand it? And as importantly, what and who matters, the questions of ethics and uh, compassion and moral scope. And I have an obvious bias in the conversations because I'm trying to develop and popularize this really simple pluralistic worldview called sentientism, which suggests when thinking about what's real, we should take a naturalistic approach using evidence and reason to ground our beliefs and our credences. Um, and when it comes to the question of ethical scope and moral scope, the clue is in the name, we should grant moral consideration, we should have compassion for every sentient being, any being that has the capacity to experience suffering or flourishing. But I'm talking in these conversations to people who both agree and disagree with different aspects of that. So it'd be fascinating to know your own philosophical journey and where that's led you to now. But before we get on to those big questions, how would you best introduce yourself and your life's work to people who don't know of you already? Okay, well, my name is Karen Davis. I'm the founder and president of United Poultry Concerns, which is a national nonprofit organization based in the United States. Uh, and we are specifically in the state of Virginia. Uh, United Poultry Concerns uh, promotes the compassionate and respectful treatment of chickens, turkeys, ducks, and other domesticated birds. That is those birds who have the great misfortune to be considered a food source for human beings. So I founded the organization almost 33 years ago in 1990, and uh, we were in Maryland at the time. And um, many things happened to conspire to my decision to start an organization on behalf of chickens and turkeys, basically. Uh, but one big issue, uh, one big event was my having met a chicken. I named her Viva. Her story is right on our homepage. I also ended up taking a volunteer job at what was then the fledgling organization, Farm Sanctuary, then in Pennsylvania, just a little tiny place at the time. Um, and um, I was just very, very drawn to chickens especially. I have a lifelong affinity for birds, all animals, dogs, you name them. But I've always had this very deep, almost visceral connection to birds. So I didn't grow up with chickens, however. I did have a very bad experience as a child that I actually repressed for many years because I never remembered it until all of a sudden when I was an adult, the memory came back to me very clearly. And that was of my best friend, Betsy Folk, in grade school, um, visiting her one day as I did almost every day. And her father reached under the house and grabbed a brown hen. I, I can see this very clearly now. Uh, grabbed this hen and laid her on like a piece of wood or something. And he chopped her head off with a hatchet. And her head lay to my right on the ground, clucking, and her body ran around the yard. Um, and uh, that was my experience with a chicken as, as a child. Plus, once I remember that my parents at Easter brought in two baby chicks, yellow fuzzy baby chicks. I remember them in the kitchen. And then I remember that uh, my mother said, well, we're going to take them to live in, on a farm. Well, actually, my father's law par uh, partner had a farm, a sort of hobby farm. And so we all drove down there one day to see the little chickens, a little older now. And I remember we went into this dark barn and there were maybe a couple hundred little white chickens. And by that time, they had their white feathers. And my mother was trying to say, oh, there they are. Well, you know, no, they had just blended in with everybody else. And of course, they were there to be slaughtered, if not on the property, then sent off to be slaughtered. But yeah. I knew nothing about all that at the time. So those were my two childhood experiences with chickens. I guess that's, that was the start of the journey that's led you to UPC and all you do now. And, and I guess we'll come, we'll, we'll come back to those questions about sure. uh, that sort of moral scope and why you came to care about birds and other non-human animals, I guess, in the second part of the conversation. Let me drag you back to this first big question, this one of what's real. 
And, and I guess the way I'm framing this sentence is worldview is answering those two questions, what's real and what matters, is because I think that if we're trying to make the world a better place, it seems that there are two problems we can run into as humans. One is we just don't care. You know, we have a failure of compassion. There's some sentient being, human or not, that we just don't care about. So that's an ethical issue. But there's also a problem that if we just understand reality wrong, if we're just wrong about stuff, even if we're compassionate, we can go off the rails and do terrible things. So that's why I think we need this combination of both a, a epistemological stance, if you like, a way of understanding reality, as well as an ethical commitment too. So that first question is this one about what's real. So for many of my guests, that's a story about whether they, they grew up in a family or a society that was quite naturalistic, maybe agnostic or atheistic, um, or one that was maybe more supernatural, mystical, religious in context, and how that side of their thinking about what's real and the nature of reality in the universe has changed over time, if it has. And that, that's another story that I think maybe fewer people will have heard from you about uh, you know, your epistemological journey. So <laughs> you can wind the clock back there as far as you like too. Well, let's see. Um, I was born and grew up in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Altoona, Pennsylvania uh, is, was then a slightly rural, but go, moving into a more uh, like uh, less rural uh, condition. But we still had a huge field behind our house then, long ago, all gone now. And um, I remember I had um, eventually had three brothers, but my closest brother, two years younger than I, I remember we used to go out into that field and, you know, I hate to even talk about it or think about it, but we would we would put grass in glass jars and then we would put grass snakes and grasshoppers in those jars. Or we would take my father's cigar box and we would put these little animals in those places. And we also plucked butterflies off the lilac bushes in the yard. And um, that's what we did. And my parents never objected to those kinds of things. Of course, these animals all died. The butterflies lost their uh, the stuff, the powder on their wings they need in order to fly. And they became all tattered. And I really, I regret all of that. And while I'm not going to sit here and blame my parents for it, I would sort of do because they didn't intervene. And it was clear that we were causing, my brother and I were causing these animals to suffer. And uh, I know my mother probably had feelings about, about it. I don't know about my father, but my mother, but um, she really didn't speak up as I can recall. And of course I regret all of that now. Yeah. So you're asking about- what, One other way of asking the question is, you know, was your family religious or not religious? Um, how did you think about reality? Because then that links into how people think about their ethics, because often if they grow up religious, that comes with a package of ethical you know, guidelines. And if people are not religious, in a way, we have to make up our own. So I'm interested in whether your family were religious or not. Everybody in that neighborhood, which was kind of a mixed neighborhood of various churches and synagogue and uh, the Catholic Church and several different Protestant denominations and so on. But everybody went to some kind of a church back yeah. then in the neighborhood. So we just went to the one that was uh, right down the block. So I would not call my parents religious. Um, part of why we went to church was because that's what we did then. People did. That's what families did. Uh, my brothers and I were all sent to Sunday school in the morning. And then when we got old enough, we sat in church. And my father was involved in the political life of Blair County, Pennsylvania. So he was obligated to do those kinds of things that respectable people do. They go to church, among other things. Yeah. And if they have any political ambitions, which my father did, and he wanted to be district attorney of Blair County, which he did become. Um, so going to church was just part of that kind of, uh, that's how you live. And that's what you did. But as far as being really religious, uh, no, my parents were not. Um, I remember once I saw a lot of cruelty when I was growing up, not on the institutional level that I later discovered, but just cruel things being done to animals. And one of them, I recall, was my father uh, beating rats to death uh, under our house with a broom and enjoying it. And my mother was upset because my mother was sensitive. She wasn't strong in expressing opposition to things that my father uh, was doing or saying, but 
she was sensitive and she went around the house kind of in a state of real hysterics saying God didn't make rats, the devil made rats. Well, that was her way of trying to just tolerate or justify something that was very disturbing to her. Fortunately, I'm glad it was. But uh, And I still can remember looking down one of those holes and seeing one of those rats, their eye, their eyes looking up. And um, uh, that was kind of about as much religion <laughs> Yeah. As, as uh, I can recall, again, I also, and frankly, I think that one of the purposes of Sunday school is for parents to have some time to themselves. I really do. <laughs> yeah. To get rid of the children and yeah. have the time to themselves when they're both not occupied with either work outside the home or, you know, being at home and all that stuff. So yeah. anyway, yeah. Um, I'm glad I know they were glad to send us off. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So it sounds like the fact glad for us, for church to be over so we could go home and eat, come home and eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like the family. I think it's pretty common, right? It was just the accepted social thing to do. Everybody does it, and some people take it very seriously. You know, they believe everything they're told, and it guides their ethics as well. And for other people, it sounds like you were more in this camp. You didn't necessarily believe the things you were told. Uh, it was just a social thing you went along with, but it wasn't really a central part of your life. It wasn't something that guided who you are or what you believed or what you wanted to do. Is that fair? Well, first of all, I was never a believer in any yeah. kind of religious belief. I never had a theological view of life at all. Yeah. Um, for me, at 12 years old, there was one reason why I wanted to officially join the church. Only one. Because if I joined the church at the age of 12, the ceremony, the joining the church ceremony, um, meant that I could wear uh, stockings instead of socks to church. <laughs> and that's what it meant to me. And yeah. I remember sitting, uh, listening to these uh, instructions or lessons, whatever you want to call them by, there were two ministers, I remember, Dr. Or Reverend Brown and Reverend Redmond. They were both totally, they sounded like their names. That's, you know, nice men, but not, not they wouldn't set anybody on fire, let's put it that way. And uh, all I don't remember anything they said. There were just certain refrains from the Bible that we uh, heard over and over again. Um, and then they were repeated. And then I was certified to join the church. The one thing I did like about church was the hymns. Yeah. Because I have very strong musical consciousness or whatever you want to call it, temperament. And so I always liked all of the church hymns and still do. I yeah, like they've got some good tunes. And all of that. So that yeah. part I liked. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Now, one of the things that's interesting is this, this what's real question. Some people try and keep it very separate from the questions of ethics, but I think the connections are often very rich. So someone who comes up with a religious worldview that often drives their ethics because there's the Bible or there's the Quran or there's... Um, you know, Bhagavad Gita or some other religious texts and traditions um, that tell you what's right and wrong. Um, but for someone who doesn't have a theological belief like you or me, there's an interesting question there. Okay, well, so where do your ethics come from? So as we move on to the second question about what matters, how did you come to think about ethics, right and wrong and good and bad and morality? And if you didn't have that theological worldview, what did those things mean and how did that develop? Well, my experience is simply I was always um, directly affected by others, whether they were human or other than human. And I didn't need any particular ethical framework to see that a dog run over a car by a car was yelping and crying in distress and in, in expression of an injury. You just felt so, that empathic connection. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I know I, I know that sounds kind of contradictory when I talk about how we grab the butterflies off the flowers in our yard and put the, the little grass snakes and garter snakes in cigar boxes and jars and all that kind of stuff. I really can't remember what my, my, what my feelings were way back, way, way back. But I remember a very strongly a, a dog more than one dog, and then a duck, a neighbor's duck, being run over by a car. Because even though we were in a sort of, um, and so, and a little, a kind of a neighborhood that, again, had 
uh, vestiges of uh, the rural life it had once been. Uh, still, there were cars going up and down 58th Street right across from our yard. And um, I saw uh, actually two or three dogs run over. One of them was my dog. And then our neighbor had uh, at the time, you could still have like my like my friend Betsy's father with the with a chicken. Uh, you could have uh, little farmed animals around in your yard. And one of our neighbors had uh, a duck and a white Pekin duck and uh, several chickens and uh, a, an assortment of uh, cats and a couple of dogs, as I recall. And so one day I didn't see it, but I was told that um, Mallory's duck was run over on 58th Street and killed by a car. Well, I remember that night very, very clearly to this day because I could not sleep. I really got into a fever. I remember lying on the couch and I was just uh, sick over that. And there was something that almost seemed more uh, horrible somehow uh, about a duck being run over than a, a dog. I mean, I don't, you know what I'm saying? A duck yeah. run over by a car. And that duck, who I knew so so well, because I visited them all the time. Uh, the other example I will give of my early, just a visceral, a natural kind of feeling of sympathy, empathy, whatever you want to call it, toward animals was when uh, Robin, a baby Robin or Blue Jay would fall out of their nest. Because at that time, there were lots of robins around, and there were also blue jays. I especially remember those two types of birds in our yard. And at that time, we had cherry trees and pear trees and peach trees in our yard. Um, and so there were always baby birds in the spring. And when a baby bird would fall out of a nest, I would just be um, just terribly upset, terribly. And my mother would be upset, too. So, again, I know she had feelings. And yeah. um, we would sometimes try to put the baby bird back in the nest. And then my mother would say, well, she was told that if the baby bird is put back in the nest, then the mother bird will reject the baby bird and maybe peck it to death and all that. I don't know if all that is accurate, but I just remember those times. They're very, very upsetting to me. And uh, I remember them well to this very day. And to this very day, I have a, a feeling when I see a baby bird like with a speckled breast or like a baby robin or a baby blue jay. Uh, there's something about their faces and just their whole body that is totally endearing to me and always has been, but also reminds me of them falling out of their nests and being helpless and uh, cheaping for their mothers. So yeah. what the, yeah. what the result of all of those nest uh, nest issues uh, finally was, did they get saved? Did the mothers help them? I'm not, I can't really remember how those things ultimately went. Yeah. Thank you. And that sense of empathy. And then I guess the motivation to, to help sympathy or compassion, I think is a really obvious common sense, ethical core. And I think it's an ethical core for most people who have a religious worldview, even though many of the religious worldviews ultimately tell you that what you really need to do even more than loving your neighbor is submit to God and be obedient. Right. So that's a different topic, but but certainly with someone with a naturalistic way of thinking and non-theological way of thinking, like you or me, that sense of empathy and then compassion seems to be a natural core of ethics. And you can get all philosophical and talk about rights and deontology and utility and feminist care ethics and relational ethics. And there's all sorts of different ways of putting that into practice. But for me, the core of morality is the decision to care about the experiences of others, you know, in some way. It's almost that simple, at least as a starting point. Um, but as you've hinted at already, one of the things that gives me hopes, hope about humans is that we already have the capacity to care beyond our family circle and our in-group and to care about ultimately all of humanity, at least in theory, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And, and, um, uh, and we know how much we still have to do that, but at least in concept, humans get that. Most humans get that. Um, and most humans also are willing to go beyond that too. They, you know, they will care about non-human sentient beings too, but we're remarkably selective about which beings we happen to choose. So companion animals are an obvious target for compassion. Certain selected wild animals can be a target for compassion as well. So, you know, there's a WhatsApp group that the local community around here run and the emotion 
the, and the outpouring of a compassion that is displayed if a baby duck is run over by a van, you know, on a street outside is, is really heartfelt and genuine. And that, that gives me hope. But at the same time, the vast majority of those people who are comparing, caring deeply about that duck will, you know, eat sentient beings three times a day without a moment's thought. So how did you go through that journey through clearly feeling that empathic connection, particularly with birds, and thinking about that more broadly, about the implications for, I know you grew up in a community where hunting was quite common. I know later on you had experience of experiencing seal hunting, you know, obviously the big issue of food. How did you go through that journey of taking that sort of initial seed of compassion for some of the birds you spent time with and broadening that out and putting it into practice? And how hard was that for you? Well, I'm not sure that this totally answers your question directly, but um, when I got to be about 12, 13 years old, that's when I began to really understand that my father going, what he called hunting, going hunting, and uh, of course, basically forcing my three brothers to accompany him all the time. And uh, there were other male relatives and people who, men always, who would be standing in our kitchen during hunting season, whether it was pheasant hunting or uh, deer hunting. And they even closed and still do close uh, the schools on the first day of uh, deer hunting yeah. season. Yeah. So I grew up in that kind of a, an environment. And once I got to be around 12 or 13, then I began to understand that when my father would come home late in the day, like in, I don't know, October, November, whenever, um, and he would have, uh, like be ha ha holding onto a dead bird, I believe a pheasant usually, and uh, maybe a squirrel, a couple others, rabbits. He's always killing rabbits. Um, during hunting season, he was always like, we don't do that except during hunting season. And then, hey, <laughs> you can do whatever you want. But, um, but anyway, um, then he would go down into the cellar. And then I, I began to understand he was down there plucking the feathers others out of the pheasants and doing whatever he did down there. And so it got to where I started arguing with him at the dinner table. And of course, I wasn't thinking about who was on my plate. That didn't occur to me at all, unfortunately. But I did become very aware that he was out there shooting these animals and bringing them home and taking them down to the cellar. And, um, and you, they had blood on them and all of that. And I still remember him saying, Things like, um, oh, hell, girl, everyone, everyone, everything hunts the rabbit. That's what he said. Everything hunts the rabbit. Like, oh, well, then that makes it OK. Um, and that was kind of case closed. I mean, we had quite a lot of very angry arguments um, at the table about it. But my father continued to hunt until he basically couldn't see anymore in his 80s. Even when he had very, very poor eyesight, he still went out there. And did that. And um, that's what he did. And that was more than anything else growing up. That was the thing that most alienated me from him because I appreciated other things about him. But that thing was something that couldn't go away and yeah. couldn't be justified uh, in, for me and still rankles and always will, as it should. Yeah something that was central to his identity, but in a clash directly against yours. So how did you, from, from there, how did you work beyond that into looking at food and thinking about other types of sentient being and, you know, I guess going broader, changing your own behavior and recognizing that there's a wider cause here. It's not just about, not just about hunting and it's not just about, you know, feeling compassion for individual birds. How did you broaden that out to a concern for, I guess, all sentient beings and putting that into practice. Okay. Well, one thing, again, I will stress, I, I do not, my ethics are not what I guess you call deductive. I don't start out as one um, person, a theologian actually said that what led him to care about animals was from a theological perspective. In other words, he has a belief system that then leads him to care about God's creatures. Whereas I, I relate directly to other creatures. Yeah. I, I don't need any belief system at all. I, I yeah. see what I see. I hear what I hear and I feel what I feel and that's it. And that's never been any different. So I've always been just like that. Yeah. But different things happened along the way. Um, 
One was that I, I ate a lot of meat growing up. I, I didn't think about animals. I, I now look back on myself and wonder why I didn't, because I know people who said that even from an early age, they, they found uh, eating at animals uh, not only aesthetic distaste, aesthetically distasteful, but uh, just uh, wrong, bad, yeah. uh, immoral. <laughs> Uh, but I wasn't one of those people growing up. But um, eventually, I was led to a book of essays by Leo Tolstoy. And one of those essays was called The First Step. And that essay was about the first step being t t toward being a nonviolent person was to stop shedding the blood of other animals for meals to eat them. Now, this was a man, Leo Tolstoy, who's the centerpiece of one of the centerpieces of War and Peace is the fox hunt. Yeah. Uh, that goes on and on and on. And it's represented as a very exhilarating uh, experience. And of course, it's all noblemen did that. And Tolstoy did it too. And um, yet, as he got older, much older, he began to have qualms about his relationship to other animals. And so when I read the first step and read, for example, how he described uh, the Moscow slaughterhouse or slaughterhouses that he visited and the pitiableness of the lambs who were tied down to be slaughtered and their piteous cries and bleats and uh, he described the uh, cows crying and being skinned while they were still alive and all of that, that was really what opened my eyes to what yeah. meat meant. That yeah. was really it. So I didn't need to know any more than that. You know, once I read that, I didn't want to eat animal flesh anymore. So now that isn't to say that I totally stopped right then and there, um, but I pretty much stopped then and there. That was yeah. in 1974. So then um, along the way, I remember there were just so many things. I eventually was teaching English at the University of Maryland, and I had a class of pre-nursing students. And I recall one of the students turned in a paper, which was an exoneration of the animal researcher, primate researcher, Edward Taub in Silver Spring, Maryland, which was PETA's first big undercover investigation. And she pretty much wrote a very simplistic paper that sided with Edward Taub and against the activists. And I told her that if she wanted to get a grade higher than a D, she would have to do more research and present a more comprehensive look and a more thoughtful look at what the issue was all about. So at that time, I only had the vaguest idea of the Silver Spring Monkey case, but that was kind of the beginning of my becoming aware of something that was developing into an animal rights movement that was yeah. in the early 1980s. So I don't recall what she did, but as far as her paper was concerned. But what I do remember is that that opened floodgates in that class um, for students, pre-nursing students, to pour out their feelings, their concerns, and their distress about having to do animal experiments in order to become nurses. Yeah. And they had all these very pent-up feelings that now they were just... Uh, exploding into uh, their expression of how badly they felt about the things they had to do. And I remember one of the students was a nurse, uh, her mother was a nurse. And she said, well, my mother never had to do any of these kinds of things to animals in order to become a nurse. And um, others just were saying um, they felt not only toward the animals, but they were being taught that if you want to be professional, you eat, even with your own human patients, you have to uh, be detached and you can't get involved with them emotionally. And the students were saying, one student wrote in a paper, well, I want to be merciful, but I have to be professional too. 
And what she was really saying was, I see a conflict. I can either be merciful or professional yeah. and being merciful or acting merciful is uh, contrary to what is considered at least by our mentors and our profession at this time to be um, unprofessional, that you have to kind of buck up and uh, not get involved with your patients and certainly not get involved with animals and all of that. Um, so uh, some students at that point just said, at least said they had decided that after all, they were going to change their major into something else where they didn't feel so unhappy about what they had to do there and what they now realize they would probably have to do with animals as they went on into their uh, higher education toward being a nurse. So that was another very big experience that I had. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I was a juvenile probation officer in Baltimore for five years from around 1969 to 1974. And um, all of a sudden, without asking for any literature, I started getting literature from what, from what was then the uh, New Brun Brunswick SPCA, uh, Brian Davies, who I ultimately got to know. And uh, it was about the slaughter of the harp seals in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And this was really my op eye-opening experience of a big institutionalized animal abuse, government-related uh, abuse of of animals. And so I remember reading this literature and just uh, really being traumatized by it. And I remember then there was something on television that showed um, the what they call the, the, the bachelor seals in the Pacific Northwest being driven to the end of the land there uh, and then clubbed to death. And that our government pays but the local people to do that. So all of that was just, oh my God, you know, horrible. So, I mean, horrible doesn't even describe it. It doesn't even. So then um, a travel agent who, travel agency, travel agent, decided to form a tour of people who would travel to the Magdalen Islands in the Gulf of St. Lawrence to see the harp seals in March of 1974. So I decided to go. Now it was represented as the seals aren't going to be slaughtered then. They're on the ice flows, which move down toward where they will be slaughtered. But you're gonna see the newborn harp seals in this particular place. And um, we want to try to convince the Canadian government as well as the local people that um, the economy would be better served by tourism than beating these newborn baby seals to death with long clubs. So I went on that tour and that was totally traumatic because for one thing, this was March of 1974, for one thing, even though the big commercial slaughter wasn't taking place where we specifically were. We were taken out to the ice flows in helicopters from Grindstone Island uh, of the Magdalene Islands. And the local landsmen, what they call the landsmen, they're just out there clubbing seals for fun, as it, just like my father liked to club you know, or, or shoot rabbits. So they're out there just doing that because that's what they do. And uh, they couldn't even understand, like, why are these people even here? Who cares? Like, what is this? And then uh, it wasn't only the local people, but it was some of the other people on the tour. Uh, one of them was a wildlife journalist, and she didn't seem disturbed by it. She wanted a piece of a, a fur from one of the seals to take back to her editor. And then there was a retired man an, from Oklahoma, some kind of an oil man, he said, he called himself, who wanted, he brought a tr tripod with him so he could take pictures of the seals being clubbed so he could take them back and show them to the people back home. And so I meet, I'm with this mix of people who uh, were, it was just shocking. And uh, one of the people there now later did become a pretty well-known wildlife photographer named Bill Kurtzinger. 
And he was very opposed to the harp seal hunt. And he told me, for example, how all his life growing up, his dream had been to work for National Geographic magazine. And he said, but one of his first assignments was to do the photography for a story about beavers. So he was sent to wherever that location was where these beavers were. And um, he learned that National Geographic, he said he, he spent several days just being very quiet amongst the beavers and uh, getting them to trust him. And eventually he, it, it became clear that he was expecting to do a lot of damage to the beavers' habitat and their dams and so on. And to get a certain type of story angle and a certain type of, of, of picture. So he refused to do that. And he ultimately um, left National Geographic, whether he was fired or just chose to leave on his own. But he said, uh, sure enough, they sent back another photographer up there, photographer up there to do that, um, to wreck the beavers' uh, homes and, um, and get that type of story. So anyway, uh, he was he was the good guy up there uh, on the tour that I recall. And also the man who actually uh, ran the tour. He was very, very sympathetic to animals, very. And he was a friend of Brian Davies. So and you probably know and some listeners or viewers may know uh, Brian Davies wrote a powerful book about the Canadian harp seal hunt called Savage Luxury, which is. Anybody who wants to know about the harp seal hunt should read that book because, it, unfortunately, it's all still happening yeah. after all these decades. It's incredible, isn't it? And you've and it feels like you've seen the almost the full range of human capriciousness here because on the one hand we do have these connections with selected non-human sentient beings, you know, our companion animals and certain wild animals. Now, many others we just completely ignore. They're just irrelevant. They're part of the landscape, if you like. We might appreciate them being around aesthetically, but we're not really that interested in their experience and lives. And there are these other classes of sentient beings, whether in the wild that are hunted or that are tested on or are farmed for food and other products, where um, we might come up with all sorts of different justifications, um, but ultimately much of that is driven by very trivial human needs right and and very tri trivial human wants we, you know with just certain types of pleasure the excitement of hunting the pleasure of eating flesh and milk and eggs whatever it is it's it's, it's a, a bizarre and depressing sort of range of responses um, and one of the things that i find interesting is the interaction between i guess religion and tradition and culture and non-human animal ethics and I had a fascinating conversation with Lisa Kemmerer, who I know you know. And you've yeah, I know Lisa and I are longtime friends, yes. Yeah. It was a she's, fascinating... visited, she's visited us and been to our sanctuary. And oh. she's actually a supporter of United Poultry Concerns. I mean, she's a, you know, she, she's a, a real supporter. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's a fascinating conversation. And she refused to be interviewed in a structured way and just took me off in lots of different directions. But we had quite an interesting difference of opinion because I guess my hypothesis is that actually a naturalistic grounding of ethics that is just says, look, there's no theology here. I just feel a compassion uh, and that's enough, right? Let's just act on that compassion as, as much as we can. And that's the core of our ethics. So I, in a way, I think a sort of naturalistic stance might be better for non-human animals, partly because I see so many areas where, you know, religion and culture and tradition make up excuses for harming animals. So whether it's the dominion we might have over non-human animals, whether it might be the idea that only humans have souls and non-human animals don't, whether it's the use of non-human animals in certain traditions and rituals and slaughter and sacrifice, um, whether it's a cultural or traditional identification with something like hunting or ranching or some other practice that just says, well, maybe they, those beings suffer, but this is so central to our culture and our way of life. And it's really important to me as a human, as it was to your dad, that itself is a justification. So um, how do you think about that interaction between, you know, culture, tradition, religion, and how much should it be allowed to justify causing harm to others? Or how do you well, think I those things think link? Any, any, I don't think any, anything justifies causing uh, harm. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know there's, there, there are, there are self-defense issues sometimes. Yeah. But most of them, most of the, cruelty that we inflict on other animals. 
doesn't have much to do with self-defense. Yeah. And it isn't the only way to solve problems in many cases either. But um, my opinion is uh, there, there is a lot of violence within the human psyche, within the human genome, if you want. Uh, I think the evidence is clear about that. And yeah. I, it's certainly very clear to me. And it's not the only set of impulses that we have, but uh, to try to whitewash ourselves as beings who are really nonviolent. And I've talked to very intelligent people who actually argue, well, they don't actually argue, they, they assert, because they don't really make an argument, because I don't think there is one, yeah. given the evidence. <laughs> look, at the track, look, at the track, look at the track record. Yeah. yeah. And, and what the more the more you learn about just history and cultural behaviors uh, everywhere you happen to read about and learn about, uh, you're seeing that uh, human violence is very much a part of human life, human societies, uh, human behavior. And um, we have to face that and 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 try to deal with it. I think one of uh, Thomas Hardy's uh, statements in one of his poems is uh, appropriate. He says, if way to the better there be, it exacts a clear look at the worst. And how did he put it? If way to the better there be, it exacts, well, anyway, it, a, a, an honest look at the worst. Yeah. We have to face yeah. the worst and see how to try to ameliorate uh, the worst ourselves as best we can. But all of that said, we have these cultural practices. Some of them are rooted in, well, let's say, let's look at rodeos. Okay, rodeos are, are rooted, that's a, an entertainment, a horrible, horrible, brutal, vicious entertainment. But yeah. it's rooted in cattle drives. And um, cattle drives are rooted in people wanting to eat cows and cattle. Um, so you have a desire among people. And from what I have read, it seems for most of human history, most people have wanted to eat animals if they could. Now, they might have eaten them sporadically for one reason or another. But when you read about early tribes, I guess, uh, here, there, and everywhere through time, uh, the idea of men going out on a hunt, particularly for a large ceremonial animal, to bring back and put on a spit and rotate and put on a table, and uh, you, often with the face and everything still there. And in fact, uh, if I may just uh, uh, mention something very recent, there was a huge, very approving article in the Washington Post about three weeks ago about a pig slaughter barbecue place in Puerto Rico where uh, people throng from uh, everywhere to have eat this, these pigs. And the pigs are on the ro rotisserie. Their whole face and everything are part of what's going round and round and being barbecued. And the Washington Post represented this all as like, oh, isn't this neat? It's, you know, it's not factory farming, so it's it's yeah. real and it's compassionate. Yeah. They didn't use terms like compassionate. Almost seen as having more integrity because you're facing up to the reality of what you've done, even though the reality of what you've done is something directly horrible. <laughs> it's strange. Well, the people who are doing it don't have any qualms about it at all, on the yeah. contrary. Yeah. So, and of course, you know, the Washington Post wants to look like, you know, they're being inclusive and all that kind of stuff. And we don't want to make, look like we criticize anybody's culture anymore, you know, and give everybody a pass, especially if, you know, they're another culture and they've been oppressed and all that. I mean, there's that whole thing that we're dealing with right now that is very problematic in many ways, such as that example. But anyway, my reading, for example, I did a lot of reading when I was researching my book, More Than a Meal, The Turkey in History, Myth, Ritual, and Reality. And just reading uh, the things that people have done since time immemorial uh, to turkeys and, 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 you know, loving to eat peacocks and swans in England. And, yeah. uh, uh, the, and, and it isn't just, it isn't just the European invaders on, onto the, uh, uh, the, what became the, what the American continent or this, this continent, uh, the native Americans had their own, uh, animal abuse of rituals and practices. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, we, we may have industrialized it and scaled it up. 
Well, uh, in terms the, of the onslaught of the, of the of the Europeans was the worst. Yeah, because the Europeans just came here and killed everything in sight. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they didn't just simple, go yeah. into it. I yeah. mean, just look at, for example, the Great Auk, the Carolina parakeet, if that's the right uh, pronunciation, parakeet or parakeet, um, uh, the passenger pigeons. Um, within, what, a decade or so, these birds who John Muir said fill the skies, you couldn't even see the sky for so many passenger pigeons. Yeah. And within a decade or so, he said they were completely eradicated. Yeah. And he said... Uh, people said, oh, they love the bonnie birds, how pretty they are. He said, but they liked better shooting them and eating them in a pie. Yeah. And there's, and there's the direct killing. And then there's also just deforesting everything to make space for farming to do oh, even absolutely. more killing. It's absolutely oh, yeah, mind just, uh, Yeah, we're eroding everything, just yeah. uh, mowing everything down, cutting everything down, which we're just, we're just uh, uh, doing that. And, um, and it started back as soon as, the European invaders, and they were invaders, uh, came to this country and just um, were on a destructive uh, war path. And, yeah. you know, there was that whole idea, I mean, speaking of religion, um, that, that uh, God had sent uh, the, the Puritans and the pilgrims to make a path for Christianity. And it was too bad that all these Native Americans were dying of uh, various uh, diseases imported uh, from Europe. But that was God's will. Yeah. God wanted to get rid of those people so that uh, uh, Christianity uh, would prevail. And uh, there were all those kinds of conceits that were taken quite seriously by the early uh, settlers and the Mayflower crew and all the rest of them. Yeah. And it strikes me as interesting that we look at colonialization now and the awful activity it was, and in some cases still is around the world. And it's very common that both religion and animal agriculture are on the front lines. So, so it's often making space for the animal agriculture that is driving the, one of the needs for more land and driving the taking of land and the deforestation and the destruction that follows. But it's often at least a part of the story. You know, Obviously, there's an economic story and there's a land grab, but there is also a religious story there as well that you know, we are quite literally on a mission from God and this is our planet and we're the righteous people and therefore we'll just take it all. Um, so it's, it does strike me as interesting that as we try and decolonialize the way we think and the way we act around the world, as some people don't want to do that, of course, but as, 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 as people, more progressive people try and do that, that religion and animal agriculture remain so popular when they're actually the front lines of colonial activity in many cases. It's, it strikes me as strange, but but it, but it's so i think you're right we need to look with clear eyes at our track record as humans and that i think gives us a sense of how difficult this challenge is um i think i mean for me there is still some hope because i think as you and i have a naturalistic empathy and compassion other humans have at least a germ of that and we can work with that um and my point of disagreement with lisa is that lisa actually thinks that there's more hope amongst religious communities because all of them have at least a textural uh, mandate to show compassion. And so Lisa's view is we can, you know, work with the religious communities to extend beyond that. Whereas there's a risk people with a naturalistic, maybe atheistic way of thinking that may not even have that commitment to compassion at all. So we had a sort of interesting perspective about, you know, whether we're more hopeful for religious communities or non-religious communities. Um, but there is some hope there because we do have, we have that outgroup aggression and violence, of course, but we do also have the capacity to feel compassion and extend empathy and to cooperate too. And I guess that's, that's, that's part of what we're working towards is to try and emphasize the latter and counter the former. So let's, let's come on to this final crazily big question about how to make a better future. And you've been working in this field for, for decades now. So I'm fascinated to know how you've seen things change as we think about trying to make a better for all sentient beings and does that leave you pessimistic, optimistic, realistic? You know, how do you feel about where we're going? What are the best ways of making a better future? Okay, well, first of all, I like to quote Coleman McCarthy, who was a peace activist for many years, for a long time. He was sort of the token peace activist and animal advocate for the Washington Post, a journalist. He also taught for many years a nonviolent course at the American University in Washington, D.C., 
And uh, I became good friends with him and I have the highest respect for him. But and he was he was very much of a, a, a practicing Catholic and uh, I suppose a believing Catholic. He, he seemed to be to, anyway. And so um, he was interviewed back in, I guess it was the 1980s. I believe it was by Kim Stallwood at what was then the main animal uh, uh, rights magazine, The Animal's Agenda. I was and lucky enough one, to interview Kim as well a while back. So, Kim and I know each other very, very well. <laughs> and Kim and Gary Baverstock, uh, Kim's uh, 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 life long partner. Um, Gary even ran a little sanctuary in Washington, D.C. for a while for uh, PETA. <laughs> and and I course. worked there for a while <laughs> as a volunteer, of course. But anyway, um, uh, Kim asks Coleman McCarthy in this interview piece, um, do you think that we as animal advocates will ever be successful? Because we're looking at a humongous situation. And Coleman McCarthy responded, don't worry about being successful, just be faithful. And what I took that to mean, or certainly how I have used that, that suggestion over and over, is we do not have control over whether we're going to be successful. We are up against so many forces. Animals yeah. are up against so many forces. But the one thing we do have control over is whether we will be faithful. It is not about having faith. It's about keeping faith. It's about keeping faith that you, with those whom you have pledged to keep faith with. And that we which you have pledged to keep faith on behalf of, that idea, that goal, that uh, ultimate desire that you have. And so once I read that, I thought that is such a clear thought because if people say, well, you know, if I didn't think we'd win, then I'd quit. And my attitude toward that is, well, then quit. Because we may win. Um, but the thing is, if you, if you are really dedicated to helping animals, you get to work everything you can in your lifetime to do the best you can to try to make life better for them, to try to educate people, to see them in a more appreciative and empathic and just light. And that's what you do. So once you think about your obligation, your moral obligation to be faithful to those animals and, well, to whatever it is that you claim you care about or who you care about, then it's not a matter anymore of, oh, gee, are we going to succeed? Are we going to succeed? It's about, I have a job to do here and I'm going to do it. And that's it. So I think that taking a, a uh, the, the approach of making a case for animals and animal rights can help you to think more in terms of constructing arguments and not so much uh, feeling bad all the time. Uh, but you have to craft a, a position. You have to craft an argument. And I have always said to people who say to me, as people do rightly, because I share all their feelings, uh, of distress and despair and anger and outrage and everything else. But uh, somehow when you switch gears and you have to craft an idea, an argument, a case, uh, it's showtime now. Yeah. And it's now you have to put something together and that switches gears in your mind. Now you're looking at the words you're choosing. You're looking at your expression. Uh, you're thinking about your audience. You're thinking about all of these things that you are going to take all of your feelings and your knowledge and your intellect uh, into to make this case or, the, again, this, this argument, uh, this uh, uh, paper or this lecture or this interview or whatever you want to make it. But you have to find a way to craft an argument or a position. Uh, again, not in, in becoming icy cold or losing the passion that you have, because if you don't have passion and conviction, you're not going to uh, you're not going to uh, win people over that way. People want to people want facts, but they want to they want feeling. They want to feel that you care. They want to feel through the emotions that you funnel into your argument that this is a ma this matters. These animals matter. What they go through matters. Their feelings matter, and 
how we treat them. I mean, when people say, for example, to me, well, you know, I don't want to hear about it. And other people say the same thing. They're up against people saying to them, well, don't tell me about it. That is about what animals go through, for example, in uh, farming. They say, well, I don't want to hear about it. Well, one thing that means is they already know that it's bad. So they're yeah. saying, I don't want to hear about what I already know. But the other thing is that I think we have to push back a bit with that and say, well, you know, may, I think that if we're going to put animals through these ordeals, we have an obligation to know what we're putting them through. We have an obligation to not just say, I don't want to hear about that. So I, th I think we have to push back to people and not just say, well, yeah, it's your journey and take your time. I think that is a, a betrayal of animals. Uh, I think it's a, a, the wrong approach. If you tell people they don't have to do very much, then they won't do very much. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. have to, you have to urge people. This, this is an urgent matter. So, and you, again, you have to be articulate. Uh, you have to have confidence because people aren't drawn to people who aren't confident. I mean, we see the exaggeration of this with uh, uh, our, our, our politics here in, in the United States, right? People are drawn to people who are, at the very least, self-confident. And so uh, you need to know your, your subject. Um, if you don't know your subject, you're not going to be very confident when you speak to people, a wide variety of people. Um, if you don't have a uh, passion, uh, you, people aren't going to be interested in, in you or in your subject. Or maybe they'll become interested in your subject despite you, yeah. in spite of you. Uh, but um, this is an issue of feeling, of passion. Uh, this, is, this is a social justice issue. This is an issue of causing great pain and great suffering and agony and terror in creatures for, in most cases, trivial or no uh, uh, just reason at all. Yeah, so yeah. we have to get people to understand that these animals matter, that they have experiences inside themselves. They are experiencing themselves from within as intimately as you and I are from within ourselves. They're experiencing the environment they're in. They're experiencing their own body, their own fears, just like you and me, yeah, because, yeah. because they're our kin. For the same <laughs> reasons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we are. We're related through evolution. Our feelings are. Our, our fears, um, they, they are not uh, uh, other. Uh, of course, they, they have their own domains, uh, domains uh, but we also share domains. And um, we have to uh, come to understand that they are beings who are experiencing what is happening to them. And they're experiencing what they want to do and what they want to avoid. So these are facts. I mean, this, these are facts. These aren't just, oh, that's just your opinion. Well, no, it isn't. It's a fact. Yeah, the science is absolutely clear. That fact on people. No, it isn't just that because you're an animal rights person that you're saying that. Uh, uh, this is a fact of nature that has been more, uh, more than enough uh, uh, demonstrated uh, by scientists and ethologists. And again, evolution shows. And just looking at the behavior of animals and, and looking at their neurophysiology and everything else, I mean, the case is clear. Yeah. The question is, what are we going to do about it? What do we want to do about it? Completely. I love the way you put that. I mean, we don't, some people seem to think there's a choice between being clinically effective and being sort of emotionally passionate, but the, the passion and the emotion can drive the critical thinking and the making of the argument and the, and the focus on getting the work done. And it, it doesn't matter whether you're optimistic or pessimistic, as long as we, as you say, you sort of hold that faith and that commitment to, to help. We have we to might... have faith in is ourselves. Yeah. We have to have faith in ourselves and, and in our commitment. I, I can talk to, to doomsday to somebody and then they're going to walk away. I, I, that, I've done what I could that, with them and it's, gonna, it's up to them now. Um, I'll just say a couple of things because I am very influenced by certain um, ideas that uh, I've encountered along the way. But I remember, our, and I've quoted this in different forums and different uh, uh, venues, that um, Arthur Kessler, who fought for, what, 15 years or so to uh, abolish hanging in England. And he was successful in, I believe it was 1970, finally. But he said, among other things, in his book, Reflections on, a ha on Hanging, he said, I started out wanting to write. Now, I'm just paraphrasing it. He said, I wanted to start writing in a cool and detached manner. He said, but feelings kept getting in the way. And he said, and I decided this is an issue. This is not an issue of just statistics. 
and uh, data. This is about feelings and uh, uh, experiences that people are having and that it is appropriate for me as long as my facts and statistics are right and I don't quote out of context that my heart and spleen are in it. Yeah. And I thought that's exactly right. If your heart and spleen aren't in it, uh, you're not going to you're not going to have much influence. Yeah. And um, that's what he said. And I thought that was a great, a great point to make. I love Regardless it. of what social justice issue or what issue that affects the life of others may be. Yeah, we need to have the facts behind us, but we need to care as well. And it's that combination I think is powerful. So. Oh, absolutely. And facts are absolutely important when people say things like, well, there are values on one hand and facts on the other. Well, values come out of facts. Yeah. That, facts are the basis of your values. So they're not two separate things. Again, yeah. I've heard some very intelligent people try to argue that values are one thing and facts are another. Well, no, they're not. What are your values if they aren't rooted in, in facts, including facts of your own in experience and knowledge? Yeah, I agree. If your facts aren't rooted in reality, what are they rooted in? And if they don't have any roots, then they're arbitrary. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on your side of that argument, too. Oh, good. Well, it's, that's been inspiring and fascinating. I, need to, I know I need to let you go to look after your sick rooster. Um, before we close, um, would you like to say a few words about your work at uh, United Poultry Concerns and how can people f- follow your work there and support you? Uh, because obviously, you know, that's one of the things you're doing personally to try and make the world a better place for all sentient beings. Okay. Well, I'm totally committed to doing what I can do to try to make the world a better place. <laughs> and do you hear my rooster right, outside? Right on cue. Right on cue. That's Rupert. He's right outside my window. And he agrees with everything I say. Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. He's my cheerleader out there. So, okay. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, I founded United Poultry Concerns in 1990 as a nonprofit organization that promotes the compassionate and respectful treatment of chickens, turkeys, ducks, and other domesticated birds. And I stress treatment and not just feelings. It isn't, I'm, we're not just uh, promoting uh, compassion and respect, but compassionate and respectful treatment. Because I have not met people who said that they eat meat and all of that, but, but I have compassionate feelings, but I, as long as I feel compassion, why should I have to act compassionately? Yeah. <laughs> like, to, my mind, to my mind, that is not a compassion worth having. If someone no. tells me they have compassion for me, moral consideration for me, they grant me moral status, but they're still going to farm me for food, I disagree, right? <laughs> that's not a yeah. compassion worth having. That's not compassion. It's yeah, I love animals, word means. but I'm still going to eat them, you know? <laughs> it makes words, those words have meanings, right? Yeah. At least they should, yeah. 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 So um, we've existed for going on 33 years. Uh, United Poultry Concerns includes a sanctuary for chickens uh, and turkeys and ducks, although right now we don't have any turkeys, but have had some wonderful rescue turkeys in the past. And uh, we're down here on the lower eastern shore of Virginia, which is uh, considered by the chicken meat industry to be the birthplace of the broiler industry, as they call it. Um, yeah, back in the 1920s, uh, the Lower Eastern Shore of Virginia and Maryland and all of Delaware is where the chicken meat industry got started and uh, became the model for all factory farming, now including all the aquatic animals. So we're right down here. Somebody once wrote an article about us, called us the lonely counterpoint to the Delmarva chicken industry. So they're very big. That's no no question about that. They have a worldwide market as all of these uh, chicken companies do. And I'm very familiar with the chicken industry. I have been through a uh, Tyson chicken slaughterhouse, slaughter plant, whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to call it a processing plant because it's a slaughter plant, slaughterhouse. And uh, I've been inside many uh, chicken uh, houses where you've got 30, 40,000 chick, baby chickens growing to a huge size in a very short amount of time of a few weeks. And I know the, about the filth and the misery and uh, the horror of it all. I've also been through battery cage facilities in Maryland. And so I've been through these places. And then I know these birds from either rescuing them myself or having had them be rescued and brought them to our sanctuary. 
So one thing that does for me is to enable me to see who they are when they're not in a factory farm situation. Yeah. What is their capacity for um, being uh, able to resume a life of some happiness or even a great deal of happiness? When they're How allowed resilient to. Yeah. are they? Um, and, and chickens are, I have to say, very resilient. They'd have to be to be, have been put through all that we have put them through, uh, certainly within the last two uh, centuries. So um, I get to know these birds when they're out in the yard, when they're first exposed to sunlight and the earth under their feet. And how the first thing chickens want to do almost always is to take a dust bath. They want to clean their body. They want that wonderful, sensuous experience of the earth. And one of the things I always say is that we have done that is so criminal to these birds and other animals is we have stolen from them their earth rights, not just their birthright, but their earth rights. They have a right to live on the earth. They came into this world as uh, earth living creatures. And religious people, you would think that religious people, people who read, for example, Genesis, these, these animals were put in the forests. They were put in the sky, <laughs> you know, they were put on the earth. And that religious people would actually think it's okay to lock them up in, uh, and to never have any experience of, 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 of fresh air, sunshine, soil, any of that. And it's amazing how, because I have been to many, uh, conferences over the years of um, uh, as poultry scientists and uh, production veterinarians and 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 farmers and 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 whatnot, and uh, I asked them how how if you and they are always Christians, you know, in the sense of uh, not Jesus Christ Christianity Christianity, but the kind of Christianity that <laughs> has sort of. Uh, is the opposite of what he stood for, from yeah. my understanding. Um, no, it's very, very opposite. But in any case, they're all quote unquote Christians with capital letters. But yet, um, you try to ask them about that. They, their favorite line from the Bible is God gave us dominion and that everything should live in fear and dread of you. That's their yeah. favorite line. Yeah, it's fear and dread, but not much, not much the compassion. Whole is concerned. Yeah. Huh? It's lots of fear and dread, but not much compassion. Yeah, that, that's the part. They, they view, as most human being, beings do, whether they're atheists or uh, have some kind of religious belief or whatever, um, that humans are superior and uh, that we, we're superior. We're superior. Yeah, yeah. Only humans can do this. Only humans can do that. Um, and even when we find out that crows and chickens and beavers and all kinds of animals can do all kinds of things, even things that we can't do. And what it, it, it's just this, this idea that we're superior. It's yeah. like people seem to need, need to believe that we're superior in order to allay certain fears that people have of being nothing. I don't yeah. know. It's almost like uh, a response actually, to an. An ex is like a response to an existential fear, isn't it? We we have to make oh, yeah. up reasons for why we're central and why we're the most important. It's like a self defense. And yet the the, the irony is that we are the one dispensable animal on the planet. Yeah. We're the yeah. one who no other animal needs. Yeah. Nothing is dependent upon us to live. I mean, we don't count when I say that. I don't count the the the, the minuscule number that we rescue from other members of our species. Yeah. But there aren't any any animals or trees or anything who basically wouldn't be better off if we weren't here. I mean, that's a fact yeah, yeah. because of how we have chosen to occupy this planet and do the things we do right now. Nothing needs us. And in fact, we'd be better off without us. Yeah. It's hard to argue against that given our track record. And one of the things that gives me hope is that you can see through people like yourself and the work you're doing, that humanity as a whole could play such a radically different role. We could really be, you know, a steward. We could be helping. We could be supporting. We could be enabling. Um, you know, we uh, and many people are working through that process of trying to have that aspiration for fairly humanity. You know, it's not just our in group. We want humanity to do well, but we could easily, we could, if we chose to, just extend that to all of sentientity, if you like, all of sentient kind and, and play a role. Given our power and our, our intelligence and our ability, we could just choose to have a much more positive role in the world. Um, and, and what gives me hope is that at least a growing number of individuals, yourself included, are 
taking that choice. We just need the other 7.8 billion humans to <laughs> come and agree with it. So I do need I to think, again, we have to do our best as individuals. Yeah. What um, else can we do? And, and, yeah. and, and, and hope that what we do will have a positive influence, if not now, somewhere along the line. So I don't know what else we can do. We have our assess, we make our assessment of the world and its prospects. And then we have to decide what our response to that assessment is going to be. It's that simple. It's that simple. Well, thank you. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. It's a real honor to speak to you. Um, I will include links to UPC and, um, and your website in the show notes and to your own podcast, of course, Thinking Like a Chicken. So I'll include that in the show notes so people can click through. Is there anything else you'd point people towards to follow your work and learn more about what you do? Is it- well, I certainly encourage everybody to go to our website, which is UPC, for United Poultry Concerns, UPC hyphen online.org. Some people say dash now instead of hyphen, so dash, if you yeah. will. But it's <laughs> UPC hyphen online.org. And there you will find a plethora of ideas, of uh, articles, of my podcasts. I I started a podcast series in uh, April this year called Thinking Like a Chicken, News and Views. And I keep it short. Uh, It's biweekly. And I keep it to around 10 minutes. And I I speak from a script that I put together, often on things that I've already written, but I make sure that it is translated into um, uh, something that sounds natural. And uh, I change a lot of words around better and more clear uh, speaking than uh, perhaps they, you know, it's it's a, in other words, it's a preparation, but it's a preparation that I have found to be uh, very valuable for me and apparently for many other people because I've gotten uh, many good responses. And uh, again, as I say, I try to make it around 10 minutes so that people don't feel like, okay, well, I have to give up my afternoon to listen to this thing. Uh, not to say, but you know what I'm saying. And and also myself, because 10 minutes is really uh, quite enough. <laughs> yeah, it's, it sounds great. And it sounds much more professional than my own amateur podcast, but uh, hopefully- The other thing hope- I'll say is our Facebook page. We have a wonderful Facebook page. And uh, we have um, uh, lots of, uh, you know, our action alerts and you know, we have many, many campaigns and things that we do, which we really, I guess, didn't get into here. But uh, people can go to our Facebook page, our website. On, they can look on our website under what's new and under alerts and they can see all of the different campaigns that we run and uh, that we're, you know, we're trying to do everything that we can for the birds. That's that's our job. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I hope my little audience will go and sign up and subscribe to the podcast too. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. I appreciate it, Jamie. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. It's been a joy to speak to you. I will let you go and care for your uh, sick rooster now. I hope they do okay. And um, thank you again. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you. Please stay in touch. Thank you for joining Sentientist Conversations. I've enjoyed every moment. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Take care, Karen.